Good morning, everybody. Welcome to an MS Views and News educational program. This is a hybrid program, and for those that don't know about hybrid, hybrid not being a car, okay, but the new hybrid is to do a live in-person program like we have here today, as well as it being virtually. We're not the only organization doing this. There are other organizations, other companies doing this around the world right now for how best they can do it and keep people as safe as possible. So this is our first for 2021. In 2020, MS Views and News did this three other times in different uh, times around the country and in different states. They were all set up just like this room is, and going forward, this is what we would be able to do as well. Okay, so for today's program, today's program is with Patricia Pagnata, and she's gonna be speaking about brain health and MS progression. She's gonna speak about COVID-19 and medical cannabis. My name is Stuart Schlossman, president and founder of MS Views and News. And let's allow me now time to introduce our guest speaker. Her name is Trisha Pagnata. She's an MS certified nurse practitioner from the MS Center of Greater Orlando. She's part of the Neurology Associates in Maitland, Florida. She's past president of the IOMSN. And for anybody that doesn't know what the IOMSN is, it's the International Organization of MSRNs. Let's welcome Patricia Pagnata, known as Trisha. <laughs> And I'm not going to shake your hand anymore. Yeah. <laughs> well, I am so happy. Happy New Year, everyone. Happy to see so many familiar faces. And um, I can't echo enough that, you know, it is good to see persons. And I hope that all of you are doing well. And um, we'll have a very wonderful 2021. Uh, so Stuart has um, picked the topics. And so let's get started. The first thing we're gonna talk about are keys to brain health, okay? And so there are some things that um, are very important for you to do. Number one, be a forever learner. There are many myths, misconceptions about multiple sclerosis, and without facts, your journey may be scarier than it needs to be. This is a chronic inflammatory disease, meaning of the central nervous system, it's thought to be caused by an immune-mediated type of attack. We used to say autoimmune, but it's immune-mediated, and that is attacking your myelin. And so it's attacking the nerves covering from one nerve to another, so that is what those scars are what we can see on MRI sometimes, but that attacking is what causes your symptoms. It's what causes um, lesions, it's what causes atrophy, and um, then based off of where those lesions are and where the connection is, is what a person's symptoms will be. So everyone is very different. MS is almost never fatal. So that's something that many persons think it's possible to have a very fulfilling life with this disease. So you and your healthcare provider and organizations like um, MS Views and News can help you understand more about MS and how to stay up to date with new treatments. Number two, this in some cases I would say would be number one, but I want you to be a participant in your healthcare. I want you to make a shared decision. In comprehensive MS care, it's important for persons to be involved in their care. You need to tell us about you. Don't delay your treatment. The report card, as I tell everyone for multiple sclerosis, is relapses, MRI activity and disability. But, the, but number four, which is not listed up here that I always talk to persons about, is being able to tolerate your disease-modifying therapy. Because if you don't take your disease-modifying therapy, one, two, and three are not gonna happen. We know what happens in one, two, and three in clinical studies when persons took their disease-modifying therapies. We also know that the most critical time for treating MS is in the first five years. Think about your first five years with MS. 
Maybe some of you in the room did not get offered a disease-modifying therapy. Or maybe there was only one or two to pick from because really there's only been disease-modifying therapies. I say only been. But since 1993, 94, um, we had the lottery. So we really have not had disease-modifying therapies for a very long time. We still have an unmet need where disease-modifying therapies are because there'll be some people maybe in this room or who are listening who may say, there's not a disease-modifying therapy for me. And that's true. There are still some unmet needs. But early on, we can make a difference. And so when I talk to persons about disease-modifying therapies, I'm talking to them about what I do for you now is going to affect you 5, 10, 15 years down the road but I want this to go away. Well, I would like that to go away for you too. And maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if I don't do something with you to help you, five or 10 years down the road, you may be saying, wow, I wish I, I wish I, I could have, oh, I should have, I, you know. And that's not where any of us want to be. So again, there are many disease modifying therapies. I counted them up and there's over 20 disease modifying therapies. So that's tw over 20 options for taking drugs. We have drugs that we call high efficacy drugs versus the, what we might call a platform therapy or the safer therapies. And the key is thinking about where you are working with your healthcare provider, talking about what your prognostic indicators are, where you are, where you want to be, and at what risk maybe might you be willing to take to get there. You know, when I talk to persons about the platform therapies, I say, well, they're the safer therapies. They're only safer because we know them more. When you look at the prescribing information, if you were to count up all the different things, the number of things we have to look for are sometimes similar to the number of other things on the more high efficacious therapies. So we just know longer with the drugs that have been out longer. Um, so that is something to consider. When we look at disease-modifying therapies, there are drugs that will kind of modulate your immune system. What do I mean by that? That means reduce your immune system's ability to become hyperactive, to attack you. So in theory, anytime your immune system becomes hyperactive, you may be, in addition to attacking whatever it needed to do, you may be having disease in your central nervous system because your immune system, when it gets hyperactive, it says, oh, I, I got to get up. I got to get into the central nervous system and start fighting off that enemy too. So there's immunomodulatory therapies. And then there are disease-modifying therapies that actually suppress your immune system. And these are drugs that are used to lower your immune system so that there are less immune cells to be able to get into that fight. So if you think about an army and you said, okay, well, you've got to go fight this other place and this other place you know, has you know, 10,000 soldiers and you have um, 50,000, it's not gonna be any problem breaking through that wall. But now if we drop those cells down to let's say 10,000, then maybe it's an even fight. But the key is that we are suppressing the immune system so that not as many soldiers are able to attack the central nervous system. And so that has different ramifications. When you're suppressing someone's immune system, you have to think about, well, what does the immune system do? So in theory, your immune system keeps you from having cancers. 
It keeps you from having infections. It keeps you from being, it keeps you, allows you to be able to recognize things and respond to them quicker. So in theory, when we suppress a person's immune system, we might have to worry about those things. And those would be the things that we would need to monitor for. So then there's a different class of medications. And this class of medication is immunoreconstitution. And so this is, these are disease modifying drugs that go in and to some degree, take out the army. They just wipe them all out, okay? And I said to some degree, and they take out the bad actors, the ones who you know, were programmed to think that your central nervous system is part of what it needs to attack. The new kids on the block are born, they come back, and they have not been exposed to these bad actors. So the mom, dad, grandparents, and community friends are not around to teach them this is what we should do. So we hope by immune reconstitution, what we are doing is giving a person a therapy that ablates their immune system to some degree, then their immune system will bring itself back because we do nothing to stop the ability of your body to make new cells. But those new cells are not exposed to the same things that the old cells were. And so hopefully we are, through that mechanism, able to um, stop your disease from progressing. Now the big holy grail would be is if I had a test that I could say, A, you have MS long before and you had any symptoms or any MRI, but, but along with that, I could tell you what caused your MS. If I could tell you what caused your MS, it would be easier to treat this, this monster. But I don't have that yet. And so I also don't have a cure yet. So it's very important, again, I hope that one day I have a cure, but it's very important right now that you're doing something so that this chronic disease cannot continue to attack you and change your life forever. So that's number two. Number three is really, really part of this shared decision making. So it's very important for you to track your progress. MS is different for every individual. There are no, no two people that have the same thing. You can have the lesion in, somebody, in your brain the same way that somebody else has it in their brain or spine or wherever, but yet your symptoms can be totally different. And so again, we talk about that network, that highway. What does your brain and your spinal cord plasticity it's important to think about that. So it's important that you keep track of how you are doing. I try to spend as much time as I can in an office with my persons who I see, but there's limited amount of time that we get. And so it's very important when a person comes in that they're able to articulate what has been happening with them. How are they doing? What's going on? How, are they, how is their disease modifying therapy working for them? In that, is it keeping them from becoming more disabled? Are they having less symptoms? Are they having side effects from that disease modifying therapy? And so it's very important to think about that. It's very important to know how you're doing so that you can identify something that changes. I tell persons, you didn't go to med school, you didn't go to nursing school, I'm not expecting you to be able to tell me all the things that I've learned over the years. But I expect you to be able to tell me about you. And I expect you to be able to tell me if something new changed. And then I go through the, the battery of, okay, did it last more than 24 hours? Have you ever had this before? Did you start a new medication? Do you have a fever? Something different, is there infection, blah, blah, blah. So go through the process of could this be a relapse? And
can then decide at that point what we might do about that. So it's, it's very important in this whole process that you remember it is all about you. But if you don't share, it's hard for us to be able to focus on you. You share and then we focus on you. If you come in and have nothing to say at an appointment, I don't know what we might be talking about. Um, but it's important that you keep that in mind. Number four, treat yourself well. So persons ask me all the time, is there a diet for MS? And as this moment, there is no diet for MS. There are diets that help people feel better. There are diets that we know can help in inflammatory diseases, reduce the risk of inflammation. What we do know with MS is that high salt diets as um, adolescents has a higher contributor to persons turning um, on to have MS, the same as vitamin D levels. But from that point on, if you eat a high salt diet, that's not going to cause your MS itself to be worse. But might your symptoms be worse? So MS being worse means that you're having new disease activity or progression of disease activity, more lesions, more um, atrophy of your central nervous system. But your symptoms being worse is something totally different. You know, if, if you have um, numb and tingliness in your hands and you have some high salt wonderful food. I, I can't think of one, but, but you know, I, I drove by a few fast food places on the way here. And so I imagine that they're all high salt. So if you ate a lot of that, you went to bed, you wake up in the morning, I bet you, you've got microscopic swelling even if you can't feel it. And so your peripheral nerves are being damaged. You're gonna have more tingling in your hands. You might have more weight. Some people are very sensitive to whether they weigh a pound or more or different, um, but we know that affects persons. So low salt will not make MS cured, will make your symptoms better. And a high salt diet will make you unhealthy potentially and will make your symptoms worse. So we know it will make your symptoms worse. Vitamin D is something that is very important. We know that vitamin D has um, immune modulary effects. It helps your immune system not be so hyperactive. It has not yet gotten to the point that we can say this is a disease modifying drug, but we know persons with higher vitamin D levels. Recommendation from the CMSC is 70. So a higher vitamin D level is better. It will help us help you. So it's very important. Vitamin D is very hard to get in a diet. So, you know, supplementing with vitamin D is very common in MS. Um, the vitamin D, the best vitamin D is the sunshine and um, many persons don't, can't tolerate the sun or, you know, that you, you get the risk of, of melanomas and all those different type of things. Regular exercise. So it's important to get regular exercise. So when I talk to persons and they're telling me how fatigued they are and, and I tell them to exercise, I get a variety of faces. Um, and it's like an oxymoron. You tell me how tired you are and I tell you you should exercise. And you're, say, you're thinking to yourself probably, I just told her how tired I was. I told her the effort it takes me to get out of my bed, to brush my teeth, to concentrate, to focus, and she just said exercise. So, you know, um, exercise is a um, unique thing in that um, when I talk about exercise, if I was to surf, um, survey everyone in the room here, I bet most of you, like most of the people when I, in my office, I talk about exercise, they're thinking about well, at least before 2020, they were thinking about going to a gym. 
And now maybe in 2020, persons started thinking about all these virtual opportunities for exercising, but still a vigorous exercise program like what you see on the commercials for some of these virtually based exercise um, type of programs. But exercising can be That is exercise. I am moving my muscles. That is exercise. I can stand here at the podium and lift my legs up. I can bend down if I can. I can bend over. I can use whatever I can. So movement. Ideally, 30 minutes of movement. Yes, it would be great if the movement was something more, you know, do you get more benefit from doing um, faster walking than slower walking? Yes. Um, and when we talk about cardiovascular health and um, the endorphins that get released from the brain, that happens after uh, 20 minutes of continuous motion. And I would like persons to exercise 30 minutes. And I have talked to many persons that could not do, literally, to save their life, could not do 30 minutes of exercise. So the best thing is to think about that. Well, I can't do 30 minutes of exercise. Does that mean I can't exercise? Well, no. You know what? Um, you know, during throughout the day, you can do different times doing the stretching, doing the moving. So, you know, moving your body. So again, try to work with what you can work with. And there, through MS Views and News, there are programs that have been done specifically looking at exercise and with physical therapists. And so I encourage you to get into some of those programs and look at how that can help you. We know that exercise improves quality of life. So it's important. Stop smoking. If you smoke, don't smoke. We know smoking moves your chance of progressing in MS um, more than 50%. So if you are smoking, you need to stop smoking. If you are around secondhand smoke, I've heard some commercials here in Florida, I don't know about in other states, but here in Florida, we've had some really um, creative, uh, both TV commercials and um, radio commercials about secondhand smoke. And so it's true, secondhand smoke can be as harmful as um, firsthand smoke. So if you don't smoke, but you have friends who do, they need to smoke in a designated area away from you. Minimize alcohol. So alcohol is a toxin to the brain, okay? And so it will deteriorate nerve cells. So it's gonna increase the shrinkage of your brain. It's going to increase what we call atrophy, specifically more um, uh, the atrophy of your cerebellum, which is your balance and coordination centers. So when you're under the influence of alcohol, might it be a little bit harder for you to do some of the things that you normally do? Well, I think everybody could close their eyes and, and think of somebody that they've seen who was inebriated. And... Um, Think about how that, but, but now multiply that by whatever you may have, and um, that um, can be worse. So the, the hazard of not only reducing neurons and shrinking your brain, but the hazard of creating a fall or um, something else that could make your symptoms worse. So that's extremely important to, so minimize alcohol. Minimize drug use. And so I did not specifically put up here um, recreational drug use. Because when persons think about recreational drugs, they think about the things that maybe um, the law enforcement officers would arrest you for. But I also, when, I look, when I'm thinking about drugs, I'm thinking about all of these things products that you can get at any pharmacy, any health food store, 
any um, site that is helping you out. So minimize the things that you are putting in your body. You're better off to try to consume that naturally and minimize some of these things because these things can be interacting with the medications you're taking and also interacting with your immune system. So it's, it's, it's extremely important to consider that. Number five, stay healthy. I mean, obviously, wouldn't we all like to stay healthy? There are some things that, you know, we can't get away from. Um, I happen to come from a um, genetic background that uh, more than 50% of my father's side died at a very young age of cardiovascular disease. And so I can't get away from that. That's part of my genetics. And so I, all I can do is, is take care of myself and monitor for that. I've also had family members that are diabetics. I can't get away from that either. So your genes you can't get away from. But you can monitor for these things and make sure that if you do get these things, that you treat them as aggressively as you possibly can. Because... If you ever listen to an MRI talk on multiple sclerosis, uh, they talk about lesions that are classic for MS. And then they talk about these nonspecific. Maybe if you've ever read your own MRI report, you'll hear or read about nonspecific lesions. Well, those lesions can happen from other things that affect your brain, heart disease, high blood pressure, cholesterol problems, diabetes, the smoking and, and the other things. So it's important that if you have a chronic medical illness that you are effectively managing and treating that because we know that persons who have MS, who have other medical conditions, who are not treating them, their MS will be worse too. They will, their symptoms will be much worse. So it's, it's very important for you to make it a priority to stay with your primary care doctor. And I see many young persons with MS who are healthy, nothing but MS, and nothing but MS. And, you know, I appreciate who wants to go to a healthcare provider's office. But you need to have connection with a primary care doctor, you need to, uh, provider, you need to have regular screenings for things that come up. And so it's extremely important that you manage that. Plan ahead. So we all came here today and I bet no one was surprised before they got to the door, it said mass required. So you had to plan, do a little bit of planning. You had to you had to pick up the mass. But the also, the other thing was, this is, this is a Sunday morning here. And so you had to set priorities. Am, am I going to this program or am I um, going to sleep in an extra hour? Because, you know, it's kind of a little bit early for me to have to get up and get there. You know, this program started, you know, wasn't an evening program. So set priorities and rearrange the things that you, you're going to be doing. Conserving energy. If you know you came to this program today, maybe that you're not going to do four other things today. Maybe the rest of your day is going to be a little more relaxing. Um, so it's important to know your limits. And know if you overdo it. I haven't met very many persons who have MS who don't tell me if they overdo it one day, they're gonna pay for it minimally one or two days later, for one or two days. So, you know, Sunday was a great day. I went here, then I had your know, birthday, da, 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 da. I went all these different places and I'm out and it's a beautiful day and you go and do all these things and guess what? Monday might not be so easy. So it's important to be thinking about that. Learn to problem solve. Um, so life is full of challenges, uh, and um, it's important that if you have a problem, you look at that. You figure out what that problem is, what is um, interacting, what's making that better, what's making it worse, what type of things go along with that. Then start to come up with ideals of things that you can do. Sometimes it's best when you are able to get through this process that you start talking with somebody else about it. 
because they may think of something that you've never thought of. Um, so you have to get ideals and things. And then it's important, so pick something. Pick something that might help that problem. And then try to implement that and see if things get better. And so go back to um, keeping track of yourself. This is an important thing. If you define a problem, track how you do with whatever you do to try to make that problem better and see if, if it's um, solvable. I said persons are very unique with MS. Sometimes the symptoms you have, again, might be different with you, but somebody else who also has MS may have experienced some similar things. And so you still can get ideals from persons who are dealing with this condition too. Accept help. And so everybody needs help. Even people that don't have MS sometimes need help. So it's important that if you um, are an individual who has been used to doing every single thing, that you recognize that and you look for opportunities to include others, that you um, look for ways that you can get other people involved. And sometimes... Um, you have to ask. And some of us were not raised that way. Some of us were raised, well, if I have to ask, it's not worth, you know, I might as well do it myself. Um, but some people who are around you may, may have no clue what you're dealing with. Maybe you're one of those persons who, oh, you look so good. Or maybe you're not. Either way, Ask something specific of someone. And so you're giving them an opportunity to help you, but more specifically, you're getting something you need done. Um, and so it's important to think about that in family life um, as you look at your family unit about the things that have to be done. And uh, I believe that now, more than ever, the family units have become less stereotypical. And I find that there are still some of those that mom has to do all of this and dad has to do all, but, but it's becoming less and less. And we do a service to others by helping them serve us and helping them learn how to do all of the things um, in life that need to be done. So. Um, it's, it's very important to share tasks with other people. Learn how to relax. So living with a chronic disease, especially MS, um, is very stressful. Uh, I can't imagine the day-to-day -day things that some people go through. So how can you relax? Everyone, it's a little bit different. Meditation, prayer is wonderful. Taking naps, short naps. Living one day at a time. Listening to music, maybe. And the choice of music, it might be dependent upon, you know, again, what you like. Listening to the music that I listen to might not be relaxing to you. Playing with animals. Maybe you're not an animal person. Maybe you've never seen an animal in your life that wasn't behind um, a cage then that's not probably going to be something relaxing for you. But, but for many people, it might be. And now they have these things that look just like animals. They make animal noises. They move like animals. These little virtual things, you'll see them if you go to the Alzheimer's Association website. They have virtual or, or um, technology technology type of animals that are really not animals. Cats and dogs, small, middle-sized cats and dogs are, are being replicated um, through what um, one might think is a um, sophisticated stuffed animal. And so that can be very relaxing for, for many persons. Spending time in nature. We know that that is very helpful. So hopefully um, you can get out and enjoy some of our wonderful sunshine that we have here. And so the thing is to live a good life, um, to look at things that are challenges and try to see them 
as positively as you can. Not everything is easy. Think about how you have changed and how you have adapted. And um, many persons see themselves sometimes, I'll have persons tell me how weak they think they are. And I think in my mind, oh my goodness, how strong you are. Because you're dealing with things that many people don't deal with and many people w would not fare as well. So give yourself a pat on the back. So that's extremely important. Staying positive and hopeful. Back in 1990, we didn't have disease modifying therapies. You know, a little bit earlier than that, we didn't tell persons that they had MS all the time. It wasn't anything that we could treat, so we didn't tell people. Persons who had MS didn't tell other persons. Um, but look how far we've come. And so it's important to think about there are things that are not good in our life, but that there are things that are very good. And so cultivate the thought of trying throughout the day to think about something that is good. And that may take a bit of work. It takes a lot of practice sometimes. So go slowly, be patient with yourself. Again, don't beat yourself up for this. Try to think of challenges not as, you know, huge things. Break them down to little tasks. I can do this. Um, and, and don't let vague fears or what somebody else might say to you change what you might do. Um, and add value and positivity to someone else's life. There's nothing better than leaving behind or leaving with someone else. So now we're moving on to MS and COVID-19. And so this has been a um, different year for every single one of us. And I'm happy to tell persons that when this pandemic first started, those of us that treat MS were just as confused, just as alarmed as many of you were. Not only for ourselves, but for our patients. And over the year, we have learned many things. One of the things that is hands down known, MS is not an independent risk factor for poor prognosis with COVID. So if you have MS and you get COVID, don't start planning your funeral. We do know that there are certain persons who have MS who might be at a higher risk. And some of this goes back to some of the things that the general population is at higher risk for. So people who have more progressive MS, people who are not as mobile, people who have other medical problems, people with MS who um, are over the age of 60, that's an independent risk factor. Men do worse with MS than women, and unfortunately men with MS, that may be a risk factor um, in COVID-19. We also know that persons of color um, and even possibly um, Southern Asian persons with MS might not do as well. We know that persons with higher level of disability, so um, when I put their progressive MS, I didn't want persons just to think of secondary progressive and primary progressive, but if you've got relapsing MS and you have a higher level of disability, you might be at higher risk if you got COVID. People with MS and obesity, a body mass index greater than 30, or have diabetes or other um, chronic medical conditions like heart or lung problems, those persons are at higher risk. And then we know that there is the risk that certain disease-modifying therapies may put persons at higher risk for COVID. And so that is something um, to keep in mind. So how do you protect yourself um, from COVID? 
well, we're doing it here today. I'm standing up in front of you much farther than six feet away, but I'm still wearing a mask. So A, you want to stay six feet away from persons if you can. You want to wear a mask as much as possible. You want to avoid crowds, uh, especially indoors. Wash your hands at least 20 seconds. Soap and water is a wonderful thing. You don't have to, you know, when the pandemic first hit, we couldn't find hand sanitizer anywhere. And, and the prices of those things went up once we could find them. But soap and water works. So soap and water, but the key is you got to get your hand in there and you got to rub and rub and rub and you can sing a song or you can count or whatever you want to do, but putting soap on your hand from the automatic dispenser and putting your hand under the automatic turn on water is not washing your hands, okay? If you're using a hand sanitizer, the recommendation is that have at least 70% alcohol. The other thing is you don't want to put something inside your body. So if your hands are not clean, be careful touching your eyes, nose, mouth, other things. So, you know, before you put anything close to a body um, cavity, make sure that it is clean. And so um, it's very important to think about that. When coughing and sneezing, Allergies still occur. We still have the pollen that happens here. So people may cough and sneeze and they're not dying. I remember after it was really bad and I was in COVID and my husband, I mean, I was in COVID. I, I, I was in a grocery store and my husband ca coughed, sneezed. You could have heard a pin drop in that aisle. I thought, oh my. Uh, but be very careful. Be cognizant of the fact that when you cough, when you sneeze, Vectors are coming out. So put your hand into your elbow or a tissue or something so that you are not spreading those vectors. So it, it's extremely important that you do that. Um, it's amazing what the kids are learning in school. Um, and so very important. Clean and disinfect surfaces frequently, um, especially those that are regularly touched. Talk to your healthcare provider about optimizing health plans and video consultations have become something that right now still many insurance companies are paying for, so we are allowed to do that. Um, the technology has been there, but it's always been that insurance companies have not allowed us to do that. The other thing is it's got to be a video conference. So if you want to call in and have an appointment with me, I have to be able to see you. So you have to use a medium where your healthcare provider can see you and interact with you. Stay active and part of activities that will enhance your mental health and well-being. Physically exercise, um, social activities, as long as, again, there's social distancing, are still encouraged. Get the flu vaccine. So it's important that you keep yourself healthy. You should get the flu vaccine. You should have your family members get the flu vaccine because the flu is still going to happen. Vitamin D, amazing. I told you earlier, vitamin D has great immunomodulatory properties. Well, we are finding that Vitamin D reports um, from some of the early studies are showing that persons who have lower vitamin D levels are associated with worse COVID um, outcomes. I caution you when I say this, that all of these studies are in their infancy. So again, it's what we're seeing. Um, will that pan out in, but it's what we're seeing. So clinical trials are being enrolled now to look at vitamin D supplementation in persons who have more severe COVID-19. Um, and so I would encourage you to continue your vitamin D supplementations as monitored by your healthcare provider. So again, it's important to monitor your vitamin D level. We're going to move on to vaccines. So vaccines are really a substance that is caused to stimulate your immune system to develop antibodies or some other way to recognize a causative agent of disease 
um, and then to be able to attack it. So that's basically what a vaccine is. So the newest um, technology in vaccines is mRNA, messenger RNA. And these are vaccines specifically ha we have right now for COVID. Um, they are not made from a live, a weakened or inactivated virus. They are technology that puts a message, sends a message to your cells makeup to make a harmless piece of protein, to put a little antenna, so to speak, up on the outside of the cell. When that is done, that protein has been made, that vaccine component goes away. Your body does not need it anymore. It rids it. So it's not hanging around in your system. Then that cell displ displays this piece of protein. And every time then you are potentially exposed, your body will recognize that and be able to make a rapid assault and um, protect you from future infections. And so we have seen with the mRNA vaccine trials that there's been 90 to 95% efficacy in these trials. And um, I'm sure I'm gonna get many questions, so I don't wanna answer questions before they're, they're given. The two that we have right now, the first is Pfizer. Um, and Pfizer came out first. It is that mRNA technology. It does require two shots. 21 days apart. It does not contain eggs, preservatives, or um, latex, oh, a typo there, sorry. Um, recommended for persons 16 years or older. Um, if you have um, an allergy to pegylated products, products that will last long, you know, if you've developed that allergy or you get severe allergies to other vaccines, it is something to have a discussion with your healthcare provider about. These vaccines have not been studied in MS. They have not been studied in other chronic illnesses. At this moment, there is a council being convened of um, specialists who are persons like myself, immunologists, um, a whole host of persons trying to come up with a recommendation for MS. But at this moment in time, your recommendation is best um, through your healthcare provider, but they have not been studied in MS. The next vaccine that is now available is the Moderna vaccine. Okay, so it's still the mRNA technology. It's still two shots, but 28 days apart. Not 21, 28 days apart. Still does not contain eggs, preservatives, or latex. Um, recommended for 18 years or older. Again, the same um, call, um Clause if you have a pegylated allergy or you've had severe allergic reactions to vaccines in the past, it's something to talk about with your, your healthcare provider and has not been studied in MS. There are three other vaccines that are in the pipeline, um, and I anticipate so, the first two on here to be coming out very soon. Johnson & Johnson, which is um, Jensen is part of them, they are looking at an adenovirus, um, which is a, a common cold type of um, virus, to be able to inject a gene into and to have that then travel into human cells and produce that same protein spike. So the same protein spike, but it's going to be delivered through a virus, um, a common virus that we all have um, most likely seen before. Um, and so that's on the way. AstraZeneca has a very similar mechanism of action, so I did not repeat that. The mechanism of action is the same, um, but it has already been approved in the UK and Mexico for emergency use. So it is already in the works. 
There's a company called Novavax in uh, Maryland that is beginning phase three trials looking at a recumbent nanoparticle technology to again introduce this component into your cell to make that protein. So all the vaccines are trying to, in the end result, do the same thing. Have your immune system develop this very specific antenna, so to speak, so that when and if you were to be exposed, your body can fight that off. We're going to move on to medical cannabis and MS. Um, so what are cannabinoids? Um, they're chemical compounds that come from cannabis flowers. Also, they're in within that are things called terpenes. And these are the chemical um, compounds that are in the same flower. They usually provide the aroma. Um, concentrations, combinations of cannabinoids and, and terpenes vary from plant to plant. And they're different from strain to strain. So there's more than 100 different variations of formulations of these um, plants. They can be inhaled, they can be consumed, you can put them on your skin, but the goal is that these cannabinoids get in and they bind to a cannabinoid docking site in your body um, and alter the transmission of signal to your brain, okay? What's the difference between THC and CBD? Well, THC, the chemical name tetrahydrocannabinol, is um, what we think is the psychoactive substance, the, the part that alters your mood, your perception, your awareness of your behavior. That's what that component of um, is. The CBD, the cannabinoid, um, it does not have those psychi uh, psychoactive properties. And so, and it's found in a much less concentration um, in the plant. Um, but there are strains that have um, a higher concentration. So that's the biggest difference. So medical cannabis and MS, um, what we know is through subjective studies, and we are um, continually working on um, finding more objective data, but through subjective studies, we know that persons use this for spasticity, for pain, for sleep disorders, for anxiety, and for bladder irritability. So these are the symptoms that persons can have with MS that we have most evidence for uh, medical cannabis being effective. Here in Florida, you have to get a medical card um, in order to get medical cannabis. Uh, and the medical card here in Florida, there's um, a few uh, type of um, diagnoses which are automatically considered eligible uh, Multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, and ALS are the three top neurologic conditions that medical cannabis cards are. Epilepsy is not on here, but epilepsy, we use ep in, in a medical form of cannabis, so one could, but you wouldn't have to get a medical card for that. Chronic pain, cancer, and HIV are the, the top things to be able to get a medical card here in Florida. So now I'm opening it up to questions, um, and I anticipate there will be things that I left out of my talk that I want you to be able to answer, ask me. Great. Thank you, Patricia. So everybody give Patricia a round of applause. I mean, that was good, right? We don't have to do it virtually right now. All right, so again, if you have a question, and I'm hoping some of you do, please raise your hand. Okay, let me acknowledge... I'll get over to you, all right? Please remember, I'm not giving you the microphone, all right? So you'll tell me what your question is, and I'll call it back out. Meanwhile, while I make my way over to that table over there, also for anybody online, you have questions, please type them in, and we'll call them out. 
First one, though, before I even get over down there is, isn't inhaling cannabinoids dangerous? So, yeah, uh, yes and yes. I mean, I would like to say yes and no. Um, the risk is less if you are getting a cannabinoid that is from a medical dispensary. So if you are going to a medical dispensary, the possibility of you getting some type of contaminant in that oil that you're going to be inhaling is much less. Our lungs were not designed to um, appreciate anything else good for them other than air. So anything potentially that you put in your lungs is not good. And so depending, again, with some of the risk factors that you may have genetic-wise or already have, or the type of oil, seeds, flowers that you are inhaling, the, the higher risk. And so I am seeing individuals and reports of persons that are getting some things in places where the purity is of question. And when that's the case, not only are you damaging your lung from something that shouldn't be there, but you're also running the risk of some impurity that could further accentuate that damage. Okay, question over here is, is there a difference between medical cannabis, I mean, excuse me, medical CBD, is there a medical CBD versus buying just over the counter, or should somebody go somewhere else instead of buying over the counter CBD? The difference in my understanding is that, again, medical grade, the concentration is higher, so you might need less of the preparation, and the purity is higher. What you can get at 7-Eleven or your favorite vape shop or maybe the person next door is not going to be of the same quality and potentially not of the same strength. Okay, another one is, uh, what can you tell us about tincture as opposed to the, with regard to medical cannabis, tincture versus smoking versus an edible? So I think that one is a little bit above my pay grade. Um, tincture, being, pin, tincture being the drops? Okay, so the, the drops and the edibles are very similar. Uh, depending upon what type of way you're getting that edible. So if you're getting an edible that was not, the, the substance was not put in it before it was cooked, then you have a high chance of that substance that was put in there being the same that you, when you put it in your mouth. When you cook a substance, so when you make brownies or something, you have a risk of chemical interaction and lowering the, um, the availability or the strength of the substance that you put in there. The drops are a little bit higher concentration sometimes. The issue with drops is you have to be a person who's very, um, has good hand dexterity or recognizes that you don't have good hand dexterity and drop that somewhere else and then put it underneath your tongue um, or in your mouth. Because if you are dropping and putting things in your mouth and you don't have good hand dexterity, you might get more than what you anticipated that you were going to get quite by accident. Thank you for that. Now we're going to take one from the online audience. Okay, these were submitted earlier when people registered for our online program. And someone asks, um, they would like to know if progression slows with age. Very good question. So I would love to tell you that progression slows with age. As a rule, as a rule, our immune system weakens as we get older. And so 
other immune problems can happen because of your immune system weakening. So might you get other medical problems that might make your MS worse? That's a possibility. But as your immune system weakens, the ability of your immune system to attack yourself should weaken also. There's exceptions to every rule, but as a rule, that should be the case. Our immune system gets quieter, and therefore the number of new attacks being relapses, new MRI attacks, should be less as we age. Disability is a whole nother um, thing because you're, that's compounded with the atrophy that comes along with aging, the other medical problems that come along with aging and potential whether or not someone is, is being active. Thank you. Next question. I believe it's hard to hear everything, you know, with listening to people talk through masks. But um, I believe that it's the person wants to know what you were speaking about with irritability to the bladder and taking CBD for this. So bladder, just like the other muscles in your arms and legs, when you think of spasticity and you think of something going tight and you can't move it or, or you know, flexing up and you can't straighten it out, your bladder can have the same type of spasticity. So when your bladder is having a spasm, it may push urine out. The other situation is it may be spasming and tightening that sphincter so that you can't push urine out. So with bladder spasticity, you can have a combination or one or the other of those things. So this can help relax the bladder and help you have more regular um, urination. Okay, the next one. This young lady would like to know what you were recommending for a person who's using a medication that's known to be an immunosuppressant, and if they're called to do their COVID, how long their vaccine, how long is they, what's the waiting period? Okay, so again, I wanna reiterate because you all are not my patients, and you know that MS Views and News is not here to give individual medical advice. And I up here as a healthcare provider am not meaning to give you all medical advice. I'm giving you information to think about. We have not studied the COVID uh, vaccines in MS. When I think about getting the vaccine, I'll make it public right now. I have been blessed to be vaccinated, not only to be vaccinated, but um, Friday I got my second vaccine. So I am fully vaccinated. And when you talk about fears, um, I can't tell you how many people that told me I was not gonna be functional this weekend. And so anyhow, don't, don't listen to other people's fears. If you are on a platform therapy your immune system is not suppressed. So your immune system should be able to mount the immunity needed if you get the COVID vaccine. So on platform therapy, your immune system should be able to mount and that includes the oral therapies that are not suppressing your immune system. There is one very highly efficacious um, therapy that does not suppress your immune system in general. And so that drug, if you're on that drug, I would imagine that your immune system can also mount the immunity necessary for you to get the vaccine and get the benefit from the vaccine. Now there are, are therapies that we have that are suppressing your immune system. Some of those therapies you're taking all the time and your immune system is continually suppressed. And so we have looked at some of those therapies with vaccines and we have made recommendations about live vaccines with those therapies. And so this is not a live vaccine, so that doesn't um, play into part. But if your immune system is weakened, then potentially the 
immunity or the amount of protein spikes maybe that you get might be a little bit less than someone who does not have a suppressed immune system. So we don't know yet, will that be enough to prevent you from getting COVID? So your immunity might not be as high, but it might be high enough. We just don't know yet. We haven't studied that, but we will be keeping data on this. There are definite um, advice about certain therapies. So before you go on therapies, if you have the opportunity, before you go on a therapy that suppresses your immune system, if you have the opportunity to be vaccinated, it would be ideal if you were. But remember, in the best case scenario, it takes 21 days to get both vaccines. So that's something to consider. But that that's, would be ideal and in a perfect world. If you are on one of those therapies that is suppressing your immune system and that suppression is not the same all the way, you would probably be better to get your vaccine with some recovery of your immune system so that again, you have those cells in place to make some immunity. So it's different depending on the exact drug you're on. So I would encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider. Everything is a risk benefit. And many of us can say we've seen persons who have COVID and they have done poorly and a lot of persons have passed away and this has been a very devastating illness. We have not written the textbook yet on what happens to persons three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, however many months after they get COVID. We do know right now, COVID is spreading highest amongst persons who are asymptomatic. So there are a good number of people running around that are, have no symptoms and therefore are not quarantining because they have no reason to think that, you know. And so we know that this is a very contagious and has caused all of us much harm. And so in general, I think that you have to consider the risk of potentially getting that virus um, versus getting the vaccine. Okay, thank you. Uh, Patricia, I'm going to ask you that you try to shorten some of these answers because we have a lot of questions to go through. Sorry, and we need to be finished in 20 minutes, all right? So we just got to go with quicker, shorter answers. First one, well, all right, we're going to let Jill take one from the online, and then I have one from the center table. What is your thoughts on adding hemp seeds to diet? I, there's no studied data about hemp seeds in the diet other than there are some persons that think it is anti-inflammatory and does help with pain, and there's some cardiovascular benefits from hemp seeds. Great. Thank you. All right, next from the center table, is there a reason why, it, could there, is there anything known about if multiple sclerosis is a starter for other diseases that can be later called comorbidities, such as asthma or other things? MS has not been known to cause other diseases. Some treatments that we have given persons can contribute to the development of other diseases. Autoimmune diseases or immune-mediated diseases tend to have some genetic um, predisposition. So it's possible if you have MS, that you came from a family that has some other immune mediated diseases and might you be unfortunate to get more than one immune mediated disease. Thank you, back to the online. I have a question about um, updates that relate to the use of medical marijuana and cognition. Is there information on that? We are studying that uh, as fast as we possibly can. And there is data from uh, Dr. Foley, who is working with um, partners. And there is some data to suggest that there is 
cognitive impairment related to um, THC use and that that cognitive impairment may not be just while you are under the influence. So there is suggestion that there is a um, deterioration of your cognition with THC use. Okay, back to this side. Well, before I get to this side of the room, I've been walking around with somebody's questions, so let me get to his. With alcohol and cannabis having similar effects on the body, how does using medical cannabinoid reconcile with the suggestion to monitor alcohol use? Just like um, I say to minimize alcohol use, because alcohol is a legal substance that you can go into a store and purchase without um, someone helping you with it is why I say that. I would tell um, an individual, if you go back to one of my slides where I said minimize drugs, uh, I think that persons should only be using the minimal amount of CBD oil or THC to treat their symptoms. So beyond treating your symptoms, I don't think that person should be using above and beyond. So minimize THC and CBD. Back to the online. Uh, thank you. I have a question and of course I just lost it. Okay, is it true that, at, that as you age, old symptoms can start affecting you again? It is possible that as you age and your body um, has normal aging loss of function, that some symptoms that you may have been able to overcome, like balance issues, you may have been over, able to overcome them, but if your muscles start weakening, your balance issues may get worse. So I think the, the key here is, don't become deconditioned. So age itself is the, the, not the issue. It's deconditioning and not managing other problems that come with aging. Thank you for that. So a couple of people, including online, are asking something that you were talking about earlier when you were saying about a registry for multiple sclerosis. And I think you were referring to COVID ms did you say that before? Okay. I didn't name it. So there is a COVMS registry for everybody to know that is of the clinicians and medical practitioners out there that like Tricia was, was alluding to, and that is easily available from the MS Views and News website. It's right like in the center top of the page. And so if you go there, you can find out about all that is being studied with the vaccines, with COVID MS itself, and what they're finding from all over the world, it's a registry as it's being reported as MS patients get sick or as they catch COVID, all right? So that'll probably take care of a lot of those types of questions. All right, now I'm gonna send it back to the online so I can run to the other side of the room. Your turn. I have a question here that is asking, if you're aware of MS flare-ups after a patient has had COVID-19. Persons who have any type of infection or sickness can have a flare of their MS symptoms. That can be as mild as just some of their symptoms being worse, or again, because the immune system got so hyperactive trying to affect that virus that it also went and caused you to have a new attack on your central nervous system. So that's well documented in upper respiratory tract infections can lead to relapses in, of MS. So the question is, if, um, if you've had COVID, okay, what's the likelihood that you can get a relapse from getting COVID and what could it possibly turn into or how bad can it get? We don't yet have the data on um, persons as to the COVID and then the 
frequency of relapse after COVID. The difficulty that with that is going to be the severity of COVID. Some persons get COVID and it's relatively mild. Other persons get COVID and it's quite devastating. So we don't have that data yet to be able to answer the question. The biggest data that we do have is that if you have gotten COVID, the recommendation for vaccination still stands. In the general population, people who have gotten COVID are still being told that they should be vaccinated when their turn comes up to be vaccinated. Online question. Okay. Um, people are, are asking about the vaccine and which one is the best to take? That's a very good question. And they were not studied against one another. The mRNA technology has the highest efficacy of what we've seen in the treatment arms, uh, research arms. The other vaccines, their efficacy does not get as high as 90%. The key is when we get enough persons vaccinated, whether you have 90%, 80%, or 70%, is not going to be as, as difficult um, because once we have enough herd immunity, it's going to be there. So then I think you have to look at um, availability. So if I was only offered vaccine X, I would get vaccine X. Uh, if my healthcare provider thinks that it would be better for me to get vaccine Y, I would get vaccine Y. So going along that whole answer that you just gave and the question asked, with regard to the Johnson & Johnson, Johnson & Johnson virus vaccine that's coming out, would you recommend patients to stay away from that? It is a safe vector for putting in the body and um, transmitting this protein. So it has been used in other vaccines before. This is not a new technology. So I would caution persons who have re um, terrible responses to vaccines as far as side effects that they might have a higher side effect profile with that vaccine than another. But that technology has been used in the past. Okay, are there any more questions in the room so I don't have to just run from table to table? Okay, then we'll go back to the online questions for now. I have several people asking if you could address some issues of secondary progression. Secondary progressive MS. So secondary progressive MS is a form of MS that typically persons go into that they don't start with secondary progressive, they gradually get into secondary progressive when their acute disease attacks become less frequent and their disability is more common than a, a, acute attacks. Although some persons can have acute attacks. For secondary progressive with no acute attacks, just gradual, progression of disability. We do not have a disease modifying therapy that is FDA approved for that type of MS at this point in time. So the key there, again, these individuals have, quote, burned out their central nervous system as to having acute attacks. And their biggest challenge is going to be keeping from becoming disabled. So my advice to persons who have secondary progressive is manage their mental and physical well-being and strength the best that they can and get with persons that can help them minimize their disability. Okay, I have another question from the floor and that is for those that are using an immunosuppressant um, medication, from each dosage that they have, such as the Ocrevus or the Mavenclad or whatever else is out there, what is the suggested time before they go out in public? So 
in the clinical trials with these drugs, we didn't have COVID-19. Okay, so COVID wasn't around when we did clinical trials uh, for these drugs. Ocrevus and Lemtrada and Mavenclad were all clinical trials that we did at my center. And we did not give persons recommendations after dosing them to do anything different in their life. So what you see from clinical trial data as to the side effects from those drugs were people who took drug and went about their life normally, did nothing different. So when you look at a drug that is suppressing your immune system, then you have to look at when you have new things that come up, like this COVID. You have to look at the mechanism of action of that drug and when are your cells repopulating and at what point and what is the thing that you are avoiding. If you're avoiding going to um, your church where there's 100 people and you're all squished in, that's something different than if you're avoiding going to the park with your husband that you're with every single day of your life and um, admiring the ducks in, in the water. So you, you have to look at that. There's no guidance that I can give you other than common sense and talk to your healthcare provider about where your immune system will be at what time. Okay, one more from the online and then we're gonna be finished with questions. I have a question from Nick, and I'm not quite sure what he means, but he says, is high blood pressure a symptom? And I don't know a symptom of what. Um, I think he's saying, is high blood pressure a symptom of multiple sclerosis? Because that's what we're here talking about. Um, and so high blood pressure is not a symptom of multiple sclerosis, but high blood pressure has been seen in some of the drugs to be a, a side effect of some of the drugs that treat multiple sclerosis. So um, no, and depending upon the drug. And would it, would it affect um, somebody's uh, response to the COVID vaccine or the COVID illness? High blood pressure is an independent risk factor for potentially doing more poorly if you get COVID-19. So would it be a, a priority for getting vaccinated? Would they consider it one of the pre-existing conditions? It would be considered a pre-existing condition because it is defined, clearly defined by the CDC as a higher risk population. So yes. Thank you. Great, thank you. So let's say thank you to Patricia for doing this program today. And of course our thanks to who? And of course, all of our thanks to all of you, because again, if we're not, if you're not here for our programs, we can't do our programs.